listening to the Up and Under podcast, starting in three, two, one. Yo, what's up, guys? Welcome into the Up and Under podcast. I'm your host, Hani. Join with me, as always, it's Ishan. Yo. All right, man. So now we're about what? Maybe 12, 12 games into the regular season, and it's been it's been interesting. It's been an interesting season, man. Yeah. I think this is the best one of the most interesting seasons we've had in a long time i think like we mentioned before in previous episodes but parity has really worked for the nba in the last two years and it's reflected in the ratings the nba has had the best ratings it's seen in a long long time so i think us and the majority of nba fans are really enjoying this lack of you know domination by one team or a couple teams and it's a very open-ended, uh, you know, competition in the NBA this season. It's definitely very, becoming very difficult to predict, especially like when you're considering the fact that there's just been a ton of surprises that have been going on in the league. You know, you know, for good, for better, or for worse, there's been a lot of things going on in this league, and you know, we wanted to take this opportunity in this episode to really, you know, highlight some of the biggest surprises. Of the season so far, the surprising team so far of this season, while also pointing out some of the teams that have been quite disappointing. So when we bring up surprise, we really mean that in a gr- in a good way, and disappointments obviously are disappointments. But man, there's been no shortage of both sides. But we had to narrow down our list. I think we narrowed it down to what I believe like about three each. Yep. But there could there are a few more that you could possibly add on to this list. But before we even get started, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the show on all the various platforms. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and of course on YouTube. Definitely subscribe so you don't miss more great content from us in the future. Obviously, working on that consistency a little bit more. But we do, we will be continuing to bring content throughout the regular season and trying to break down <laughs> the crazy thing that has been this season. And when we talk about parity and um, you know the surprising teams, both good and bad. You know, it harkens back to our discussion in previous episodes about the amount of talent that the NBA now has. Um, and, you know, it's it's the greatest talent pool the NBA has ever seen. That's for sure. And it's reflected in that in, you know, in the NBA and the rest of the teams where if you look at 1 through 15, there's a legit case for all of them to have like really good players um, and all of them to have some sort of potential to do something. Even if it's not for right now, for example, when you're talking about the rebuilding teams. Um, but in terms of the most surprising teams, we'll start off with the good. And I think it obviously has to be the Utah Jazz. Nobody expected the Utah Jazz to be in this situation right now Including at the top Danny of the West. H. Exactly. Like, I don't think you can point to one person. I, I don't think you'll find one person who would have thought that the Utah Jazz are at the top of the Western Conference right now, especially with all of the new players that they have. They have a new coach now. So everything is completely new. Danny Ainge came in. um, He blew up that team. You know, that team had had regular season success, some little bit of playoff success. uh, But again, that was their main issue for the past, you know, better part of half a decade. Um and so Danny Ainge came in there and he blew up the entire team. They brought in a new head coach in Will Hardy. They brought in a bunch of new players. Um, and we all expected this to be a tank job for Victor Wembanyama. And I think even the Utah Jazz expected that. Nobody would have thought this collection of talent um, would have succeeded. But right now, they're top five in offense. They're top 10 in defense. Um, I think currently right now, they're 11th in defense ranking. And as I said, they were supposed to be tanking, but with the collection of players that they have, including the system that Will Hardy has implemented, it's a very modern um, and a very efficient system. You know, they're top 10 in assists, um, they're top 10 in three-point attempts and makes, so they shoot a lot of threes and they make a lot of threes, they share the ball, they just work very well cohesively as a team. And now offensively, you can see the potential in that with guys like Larry Markin and Colin Sexton, Jordan Clarkson, you can see the potential in that. But I think the main surprise for the Utah Jazz has been how good they've been defensively, and that's pointed to the uh, the the culture that Will Hardy has brought in. Um, you look at the highlights for the Utah Jazz. You have Jordan Clarkson cutting off ball screens. Like who would have thought Jordan Clarkson would have ever done that in his career? But he's doing it this season. Um, they had a they have a great young player in Walker Kessler who really has made an impact, and he's been a great center for them. Larry Markkinen's been working hard on the defensive end. 
So they've all bought into the Will Hardy system. As a result, they're working very well as a team. We're talking about, you know, the parity of the NBA and the talent pool of the NBA. I think the Utah Jazz are a prime example of what talent in the NBA looks like and how dominant a team can be with just regular, quote-unquote, regular players. And I think the biggest thing for Utah is just from the standpoint that over the last, like, few years, like, like five or six years, things have just gotten stale, you know, which is kind of the reason why you let go of a guy like Quinn Snyder, which is why there was turmoil between, you know, Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell, um, despite what they, despite what Donovan Mitchell says. There was definitely some sort of tension there. Well, again, to be fair, it didn't help with everything else that happened in the past two years, but, Yeah, you know. but, like, ultimately speaking, there was just a lot going on, and I think now that you're seeing a collection of fresh talent um, like, like again, like these are younger, hungrier players. You're bringing a new voice. Uh, n- I mean, again, Danny Ainge is a relatively new executive. It's a lot of change um, for the Utah Jazz. And I think it's change that all kind of coincided and like everyone kind of bought in at the same time. It really reminds me of when Danny, when Danny Ainge kind of was transitioning to Brad Stevens with the Celtics. You know, exactly. The, the old era Celtics getting rid of guys like Pierce, Garnett, you know, Rondo, and transitioning over and getting guys like Tatum, Brown, and like Marcus Well, Smart. not even that. The period before that, that transitional period where they were, you know, playing guys like Isaiah Thomas, you know, yeah, those yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. teams yeah, you know, where so, it wasn't expected that they would do as well as they did, but they they really did end up playing that good. Yeah, and again, I, I think, and again, the, the people thought the Celtics were tanking back then too. It was just kind of a, a fortunate situation where Isaiah Thomas – you know, captured a spark, was great for the Celtics during that time. Brad Stevens emerged as one of the best coaches in the league. And again, it's a similar vibe that you're getting with this Utah Jazz team. Now, and I, I have think, to say, Larry Markinen, man, like he's been playing like an all-star. If he keeps this up, I think he should make his first all-star team, uh, especially if the Utah Jazz are at the top of the West. I mean, I'm not going to go that far. And that's kind of where I was getting to in my next point is that how sustainable is this for the Utah Jazz? I think right now through about a 12 to 15 game sample size it's still a relatively small sample size but if they keep this going like well into december heading into january then we're talking about a much different conversation where the utah jazz would potentially be a lock for the playoffs and potentially could be able to do something maybe win around well either way i think this is already a w season for them this is already being a win of a season except for danny Ainge. well yeah He's but I mean, tried again, to tank and he couldn't do it. I mean, here's the thing with tanking now, obviously the draft odds are lower, so it's harder to get who you want. But then also like it's it's never a bad thing to be ahead of schedule. You know, I think a lot of fans sometimes will want their team to be so bad that they get a good draft pick and whatnot. But mm-hmm. if you look at the rebuilding teams and how it's worked out for a lot of these rebuilding teams, there's a reason why perpetual rebuilding teams are perpetual rebuilding teams because they never get over that hump they never get to that next stage and that has a lot to do with internal progression um so i don't think it's ever a bad thing if you have internal progression or ahead of the curve yeah but i think if you're danny age i think you gotta stop if you want to really tank you gotta pull the sam hinky at this point like, that's well it. again it doesn't really work at this point anymore clearly he tried everything and it didn't work but yeah the utah jazz definitely been a very positive surprise to start the season which flipping things over into a disappointment and i know it's early but can we just say the Philadelphia 76ers have been a disappointment? Like, I think it's fair to say we didn't expect them, especially even us, we didn't expect them to be this bad. We had them the, at the top of the East in our predictions. Uh, I think we, yeah, we had them in, the, in, the, in like at least the top three, I think, yeah. for sure. But yeah, and, I, and I, again, we weren't the only one. The Sixers had high expectations coming into the season. You know, when you're bringing in, you have now a full training camp and an a off season of James Harden, where James Harden actually put in the work. Uh, you're gonna get um, improvement with Tyrese Maxey, motivated Joel Embiid. Like you re up the the bench with uh, supposedly more talented players. The Sixers had a lot of expectations coming into the season, and currently they're 11th in the Eastern Conference right now. They are 27th in points per game. Their offense is absolutely abysmal. Uh, the 13th in defensive rating, which is basically the only thing that's saving them right now, and they're 29th in pace. So they're slow, they can't score, and they're middle of the pack defensively. You know, and this is despite having Joel Embiid uh, still averaging about 28 a game. Uh, you you have James Harden, who's currently injured, but when he was playing, he was playing relatively well. Tyrese Maxey's having a breakout season. This guy dropped like 40 point 40 points over the like 
like a week ago or something like that. Like Tyrese Maxey has been great, but again, the Sixers have just been disappointing, you know. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're getting absolutely nothing from their bench unit right now. And that was the thing that we everyone expected was going to be better for the Sixers versus last season, when the bench was going to be significantly improved. They brought in PJ Tucker, they brought in Daniel House Jr. You know, um. I'm skipping out on some names here, but either way, it's like you brought in guys to you know help help your bench, and they bring Deanthony Melton. Deanthony Melton, but he's been I, I'd say Deanthony Melton's been pretty well. Deanthony, solid. I was gonna bring that up. Deanthony, Deanthony Melton and George's Niang are your top scorers off the bench with nine points each. Then again, who what else are you getting? Daniel House four points, Matisse Tybel one point four points a game, and PJ Tucker five points a game. Like that's literally like George Niang cannot be your top scorer off your bench. For you to be a successful team. It just can't be that way. And, you know, the bench has been bad. But I think Embiid is also just looks a step slower than he was last season. To be fair to Embiid, he is coming off of that injury. But... When isn't he coming off of that's, injury? That's my point, right? That's being the story of Embiid's career. Two things. I think, number one, obviously, we know Doc Rivers sucks. I think everyone knows that. Um, and Philly fans have every right to be mad about why Doc Rivers still has a job. Uh, because, frankly... Like we said numerous well, who are they times. Gonna get? <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing. They have the Sam Cassell option, which I think a lot of fans favor. Um, he still hasn't had a head coaching job yet, which to me is pretty insane because he's been in the conversation around the league for like, feels like 10 years at this point. Um, so we know the Doc Rivers situation, number one. But I think it, also there's a identity issue with this team in terms of, you look at, for example, when Embiid plays versus when he doesn't play. When he plays, they have as you mentioned, the slowest pace in the league or one of the slowest paces in the league. You look at the couple of games that he was out and how much faster they played, especially with Tyrese Maxey leading that team. Tyrese Maxey is fast. And then on top of that, you have the discussion of how James Harden fits in with this team. Now, granted, James Harden has been great. Don't get me wrong. But there's a bit of an awkward fit, especially when you consider how he fits next to Tyrese Maxey. Though, again, I won't say that Tyrese Maxey doesn't need James Harden because... Tyrese Maxey is quite limited as a, as a playmaker, so if you have him as your starting point guard, you're going to have some issues. Um, but there is still some sort of disconnect there in terms of their play styles and how they mesh with each other. Then you have the Embiid factor with both of his guards as well. And it, it's a bit of an awkward fit at times. And this has kind of been a theme throughout the Joel Embiid tenure. Not that I can say it's necessarily his fault because he's a top five talent in the league. You build around him. But at the same time, it's not been a seamless fit um, throughout his whole time there. So I think it's been some of the same issues this year as we've seen throughout the past number of years. And, I mean, Philly fans are definitely frustrated. Yeah, and they have every right to be. And I think, I think to me, the best way to solve this, they need more out of Tobias Harris. I'm sorry. Well, that's the problem. You're paying him $36 million and he's only averaging 15 points a game for you. Granted, he's been quite efficient in that in those in the in those getting those 15 points. But again, even the games that I witnessed of Tobias Harris, he doesn't he lacks the aggression. He's very easy to target defensively. Like Tobias Harris is just playing like an average player making non-average money, which is not okay for a Sixers team that doesn't really have cap space, isn't getting production from the, the lower end of the, the, the back end of the bench. So you need guys like a Tobias Harris to step up. You know, Tyrese Maxey's doing great on his own right, but he's still a young player in his own, in his own respect. But yeah, man, the Sixers definitely have been disappointing. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The Tobias Harris saga has been a dis- disaster for the Philadelphia 76ers. As Jimmy Butler Outside said. of maybe last year's playoffs... Uh, he's it's it's just been a perpetual disappointment. Unfortunately, As Jimmy Butler said they chose Tobias Harris over Jimmy Butler. Yeah, well, Philly, right? Yeah. Uh, moving on to a good surprising team. We're talking about the Portland Trailblazers. The Portland Trailblazers are also at the top of the West. They're currently the second seed. Um, and the Portland Trailblazers, I think, are interesting team. They're middle of the pack offensively. Um, right now, I think they're currently like dead middle at fifteenth. Uh, however, they do have a top 10 defense. I think right now they're at six. Um, I would say this Portland team is interesting because I think for us, we didn't have them making the playoffs, but we definitely said there's yeah. some potential with this team to do something. This is by far, I think, the most complete team Portland has had since their conference finals run uh, in 2019, 2018, one of those years. Um, 
And I think it's helped that Damian Lillard has gotten back to form. Off, obviously, last season he was dealing with his ab injuries. Um, but yeah, Damian Lillard is back to his old form. He's averaging around 29 points a game. But the the difference is this year he has those complementary pieces. You have the C.J. McCollum um, replacement with Anthony Simons. But then, as we said, Jeremy Grant was a very, very under-the-radar major pickup um, for Portland when they got him. And the fact that Portland was able to get him for just basically a draft pick, which turned into Jalen Duran. So, again, it was kind of a win-win for both teams in that regard. But the fact that Portland was able to get one of the best two-way wings in the league and Jeremy Grant and who like a guy who's really stepped up his offense in the last couple of years too, you're seeing the the benefits of a guy like Jeremy Grant on this team. You also have other guys like obviously Josh Hart, Yusuf Nurkic who are doing their thing as well. But I think the main thing is um, also shout out Shaden Sharp, fellow Canadian. But I think the main thing is you have Damian Lillard in his natural role playing what he normally does, and then you have your complementary pieces. I would say this team, interestingly, has been sort of unremarkable. As I said, they're middle of the pack offensively. They are a top 10 defense, which is definitely good. But again, this is kind of looking like an average or above average team. It's not looking like the most remarkable team in the world. But the one thing about this team that they do have is the clutch factor, which has gotten them to that 93 record that they currently have. Uh, they've won a number of games in the clutch. Jeremy Grant hit a game winner, though that was a travel. But what is a travel in the NBA now? Josh Hart hit a game winner. Uh, Damian Lillard, of course, has had a bunch of clutch shots. Same with Anthony Simons. So I think this Portland team, they have those veterans and Jeremy Grant, Damian Lillard. They have a very nice complimentary team, a very well-fitting team. I don't know how far they'll go in terms of the playoffs, um, especially with Damian Lillard being as their being their star and then like not any other all-star superstar caliber players around him. But I think this is a very nice team and they definitely get the job done for, for what you expect from this team, I think. Like, I think to your point about like you, you, you saying that the middle of the pack, I think that's exactly where they wanted to be, which is they wanted to at least be a playoff team. And like, again, they're still building, which is why they still have future assets. They still have some cap flexibility, um, you know, coming up. So, the well, po- also, Gary Payne hasn't even played yet. So. Yeah, so Portland isn't done and making moves. And they can potentially even go out and make a trade. They have some draft capital now that they can make a move if they want to. But the reality is that this is a much improved team from last year, which is exactly what you wanted to do when you convinced the guy like Damian Lillard to remain in Portland. You know, you wanted to com- put in a recommit to him saying that, hey, hey we're, tr- we're, we're trying to build around you. We're resetting things. We're trying to new stuff out. And so far, it's been working. Again, we both really like the signing of Jeremy Grant, uh, the trade. Sorry for Jeremy Grant, uh, and even some other some of their other signings. Like I thought, J- Josh Hart was a, is a great complimentary guy. Uh, again, Anthony Simons has been great for them. Gary Payton. We still haven't seen Gary Payton. So again, uh, there's there's still there's a lot of things to like about about what Portland is doing right now. So there's de- there's definitely been a pleasant surprise to say the least uh, in the Western Conference. Now flipping things back over to the disappointment side of things. And um, honestly, I take full pleasure in, in in this one. I take full pleasure because, to be honest with you, I don't see them remaining this bad for long. And I'm talking yeah, about the not. I'm talking about the Golden State Warriors. And we both would be lying if we said that we thought the Warriors would be in this position to begin. Listen, we had them at the top of the West. In our we did. We had them at the top of the West. They're the defending champs, but they're off to a very very rocky start to the year. Currently, at the time of this recording, 12th in the Western Conference. Uh, they're 13th in offensive ratings, mainly due to Steph Curry. But they're 27th in defensive rating. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Stephen Curry has been carrying this Warriors team, uh, averaging close to 33 points a game. Um, he's leading them in scoring. And again, nobody else is really contributing. Like, I, was, I asked Zisha to kind of guess well, who's the ne- what's the next highest scoring average on the Warriors, and it's 18 points a game by Andrew Wiggins. Like, when you're talking about your, ma- your top guys making, shooting, making 32 points a game, and then the next guy below him is making 18, that's a 14-point difference between your top guy and your secondary guy, which is not a winning strategy in today's NBA. So... You know, no one's really contributing. And it also doesn't help with, with the standpoint that guys are, a lot of guys are struggling. Clay Thompson, for example, 
mightily struggling right now. Obviously, he's being a shot chucker, man. And he's been doing this since he came back last season. I get you have a point to prove, but, bro, you've gotten this far because of how you played. This new style of Klay Thompson doesn't work for you, man. Yeah, and he's not shooting well. He's shooting the worst percentage of his of his career. I think he's shooting about 33% from three. For, it's it'll, like, it'll go up. It'll but. go up naturally, but again... Clay's been pretty bad, only averaging about 15 a game. Jordan Poole, hit or miss, depends on the game. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm still not 100% sold on Jordan Poole. I get why the Warriors had to pay him and all that stuff, but again, th- consistency is important, and he's never really shown, that besides, besides last season, that he could remain consistent. So that's still a question mark. Draymond Green has just been flat out bad. You know, he's still Draymond. He's still going to do his thing. But the fact of the matter is the Warriors have the 27th ranked defense. And defense is Draymond's calling card. It's not a great look for Draymond Green. And, uh, you know, speaking of other problems that the Warriors have. I mean, the fa- you know, it's one thing that the top guys aren't scoring. But at least their starting lineup isn't, is all the starters besides Draymond are averaging double digits. Well, I mean, they still have, like, one of the best starting units in the league. Yeah, no, but again, when you when you consider the fact that okay, they still have one of the best starting units in the league, but off the bench they're getting literally nothing from them from them. It's still better than the Sixers bench, but again, they have nothing. Like Dante DiVincenzo hasn't been doing much. Um, the young guys have been relatively disappointing. Kaminga and um, Moody, Moody and Wiseman. These guys have been kind of relatively disappointing. And you know, to be honest with you, like they've just been, you know. Letting go of the, some of the veteran guys like Gary Payton, Otto Porter. Is Bielitsa kind of, went to Europe. Bielitsa. Like, letting go of these guys is kind of slowly starting to show their uh, their effect. Because, again, those veteran guys. Like, I mean, we just saw Otto Porter have a great game for the Raptors and helping them secure a win. Like, so these veteran guys have their place and have their role. Just knowing how to play, knowing how to make some shots is imp- definitely important. Well, that comes with the territory of where they are and financially, right? Because of the fact that they've had to commit all of their money yeah. to their starting lineup now. And we've seen it work for the Warriors in terms of the past couple of years. But now that you're fully committed to that starting lineup financially, your bench is going to suffer. The hope with the Warriors was mainly that their young guys that they drafted would help fill out that loss of depth. Yeah. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Moses Moody is... Hit or miss. Sometimes he looks good. Other most of the time he's just okay. Um, Kuminga has been a project to say the least. Uh, I know everyone wants to crap on Wiseman. Um, I get it. He's been pretty bad as well. But to he be is fair, coming off he's coming off of injury. Also, he's not. He's not getting enough minutes to warrant how how bad people have been crapping on him. Right. So like again. That goes hand in hand. He's not getting minutes because he's been bad. Do they start but, Looney? Uh, yeah, they do. I think. I don't think they start Looney. Actually, I guess no. they play Draymond at center. Now. Unless they're bringing Poole off the bench. No, they bring they start Poole now. I think. Yeah. So then. Um, yeah. So then. Yeah. Kevon Looney's in front of him. But yeah, like Kevon Looney, I think is the only reliable guy you have as a depth piece. Other than that, you're looking at very, very top heavy Warriors team, and as we've said, we said this last off season where the financial aspect of the team is going to start catching up with them unless something crazy happens. There's and this would have happened, you know, years ago if it wasn't for the boom in the salary cap when yeah. they got Kevin Durant. And so I think you're seeing there's not a boom in the salary cap anymore. And so you're seeing the financial aspect of having a championship team catch up with you. There's a reason why championship teams last a few years and they're great years, but then they really fall off afterwards. There's a, str- a a growing possibility that both Draymond Green and Klay Thompson might not be a part of this team uh, next season. It's 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 a becoming a possibility just from the standpoint that they have to make money, they have to free up some money somehow, and they have to. And these guys are getting older, and if they're regressing, then you got to make decisions. Exactly. It's that, just getting to where, that point. where does that leave Steph Curry? Who knows? I think Steph Curry will still retire on the Warriors. No, he's he's Steph Curry's gonna stay to stay with the team. He's still producing. He's still being the main guy. But I, which is why I I still think the Warriors have a chance to turn things around. I'm not writing them off completely. Like you know, if Clay returns to form, they can they can get back within a playoff spot. But so far, it's just been very. I don't think the issue of them is for this year is them making the playoffs. I think they'll be fine for this year. 
The problem is, are they championship? Are they champion? Exactly. Are they championship contenders? So and far, this no. is definitely not the same team that they had last season. No, for sure. Not at all. Uh, moving things back to a positive, surprising team. We're talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, I think everyone expected them to be pretty good. Yo, they're low-key but scary. they are very, very good. Um, they're top five in offense and defense. Both. They're currently third in offense, second in defense. Um, again, as we said, they're supposed to be good, but they've been really, really good. They're just a very good overall team. Um, they're good. They have their all-star backcourt in Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell. You have your defensive front court in Evan Mobley and Jerry Allen. And then you have a bunch of good depth pieces like Kevin Love coming off of the bench, being a six man of the year candidate. Um, you're still waiting for Ricky Rubio to come back. So when he comes back, it's going to be even better. I think the main weakness for the Cleveland Cavaliers is at that three spot with their you know small forward. And ideally, Karis LeVert could help alleviate some of those issues. But unfortunately, I think we know what Karis LeVert is at this point, which is, you know, sometimes he's really good. Sometimes he's just non-existent, right? But I think the main thing with this Cleveland Cavaliers team as to them being surprising is just the how well Donovan Mitchell has fit in on this team and how much he's surpri- her, he has surpassed expectations himself. Um, he's officially, I think, taken that jump into being a very, very uh, entrenched number one option, a finisher for the Cleveland Cavaliers. The guy who gets, exactly, the guy who gets it done for the Cleveland Cavaliers, the guy who the Cavs all look to to finish the game. But beyond, obviously, the scoring, because we've always known him as a scorer, but he's taken a huge step in terms of his playmaking, his defense. J.B. Bickerstaff challenged him before the season. He said, listen, you have all the tools to be a great defender. You're a good defender in college. You haven't done anything on defense since in the NBA. So play some defense and you can be a good defender. And he's turned himself into a good defender for the Cavs. And obviously we saw the potential for his playmaking in the in his last few years in Utah. But he's really turned it up a notch, especially when Darius Garland was out and he had to be the primary playmaker. He was he was balling, man, as as a playmaker. So I think Cleveland Cavaliers, their their surpassing of expectations mainly stems from the fact that how much better Donovan Mitchell himself has gotten. Yeah, no, I think the Cavs, I expected them to be good event like down the stretch. I just didn't expect them to be to have everything come together this quickly. Like even from game one of the season when the Raptors ended up beating the the Cavs, like I was definitely like I I the, the Cavs scared me. They absolutely did because again Donovan Mitchell looked great. Uh, he looks even better than he's been. Like again, the playmaking, the defense have all been there on top of the scoring. And I think again, the playmaking, a lot of that is coming from the fact that. It's a different team. It's a stronger team. Better weapons on, uh, with him than he had in Utah. So, on top of that, the defense is still good for Cleveland. They have, you know, contributors up and down the roster. It's it's a well-built team. Like, this team, you know, you can always get deceived when you look at a team on paper. You're like, this can be a good team. They're a good team on paper and, you know, in reality as well. And this team, if the way things are going, again, third offensively, second in defense, like, these are, Those are championship numbers. These are championship numbers, man. Now, I still think experience is going to play a factor, obviously, when you're comparing them to a team like the Milwaukee Bucks, for, you know, for instance. But so far, I shout out Kobe Altman. He's done a very good job with this team. It's a huge turn from what we were saying about him like four years ago. Yeah, but I, I think now that he's got an opportunity to build the team, he took, he took a risk in getting Donovan Mitchell and interfering with that. It's paid off. And sometimes you want a general manager willing to take a risk, you know, you know, case in point, Masai Ujiri with Kawhi Leonard, you know, but sometimes it works out and it leads to, it leads to great things. So maybe it might lead to something good for the Cavaliers. So far, it's working out very well for them. Listen, man, the Cavs are back. They've been back since last year, and this is definitely the best thing they've done since LeBron. This is the most complete t- version of the Cavs. I think even with when they had LeBron in no, the No, for sure. This years, is definitely the most This is a better team. This is opinion. definitely the most complete team they've had since those 90s Cavs for sure. Um but yeah, like either way, we'll see what they do in the playoffs because that'll be the real test. But I think already you have time if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers. This isn't a make or break season no, for you. No, they're still so young. There's still so much potential for this team. But so far Cleveland very pleasantly surprised with them. Finally, the last disappointment and we saved this for last because if, if, is there really any bigger disappointment that has been over is the last... Is there any bigger headline? Pretty much. Like, 
I think this this team will go this team will go down as probably the biggest disappointing uh superstar team in NBA history and it's the Brooklyn Nets. The Brooklyn Nets I, I have one word, garbage. They suck. I'm sorry. The what hasn't gone wrong for the Brooklyn Nets? The the organization, not just the team, like the organization. Like. It's so crazy because like before they got Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving, they had one of the best cultures in the league. They had the most brightest up and coming future. Things were looking great, and as soon as they decided, they pivoted away from that and went the superstar route. The New York mentality got them, bro. Basically, and everything went downhill from there. Obviously. Again, they're currently 10th in the Eastern Conference. They're about middle of the pack statistically. And that's a lot of that is because of Kevin Durant, which we'll get to Kevin Durant in just a second. But they've been bad, dude. Like, they've been very, very bad. They've already fired Steve Nash. So they fired their coach. Um, Kyrie Irving is um, unavailable. Kyrie Irving. He's unavailable. And for the reasons where... I'm just going to chalk it up to pure stupidity. I just think... He didn't have to do that, to do what he did. But the reality is, is that in today's society, like, he should have been a lot smarter about it. Now, is has the punishment been a bit egregious, in my opinion? Of course, I think so. I think the backlash has been a little bit severe. But, again, when you're the first to do this, you, people tend to set a precedent with you. So, and apparently this guy didn't even watch the movie. So why are you promoting if you didn't even watch it yourself, bro? I, it... it it was an avoidable situation, and Kyrie Irving clearly did not get the memo, as per usual. But, again, that's Kyrie Irving, man. Yeah, like, my only problem with with, with the situation now is that, again, the the conditions they're putting on this guy to come back, I think, are absurd. But that's just my my opinion, of course. But he still, he still messed up, and he, that, it's completely his fault. But Kyrie Irving, away from the team. Um... And Kevin Durant is basically backpacking this team like he did last season um, and trying his best to will this team. Now, again, they have some nice pieces. Obviously, I think Seth Curry still hasn't played Well, yet. he just came back. He and just he's came been, back. I mean, he's been Seth Curry. He's been good. Yeah, so again, they, they, they have some talent. Seth Curry, Royce O'Neal has been okay for them. Obviously, you know, Utah Watanabe. Shout been, out Utah. The new face of the franchise is Utah Watanabe. Uh, but, you know... Again, they, they have some nice pieces, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the team's not good. And uh, by the way, Ben Simmons sucks. Like, can we finally admit that I was right? And the, the Sixers jumped the gun. They paid this dude too early. This dude does not care about playing ball or improving in his game in any sort of facet. And we're seeing it. The guy is averaging five points a game. Five. He doesn't even look at the rim, man. Like, dude. Like... And he's shooting only 44% of the field. Like, you would think a guy who doesn't shoot the three, would majority of his points would come, you know, closer to the basket. He should be shooting a higher percentage than 44% from the field. Like, Ben Simmons is one of the... One of the he's the personification of the modern-day NBA player, which is, like, no heart, take your money, and just whatever. You know, don't really focus on improving your game. Like... I swear to God, he's everything I hate about what the modern game is becoming. And this guy is single-handedly screwing over the Brooklyn Nets. Because imagine if Ben Simmons was still bringing his defensive prowess uh, with his playmaking, um, averaging about 10 a game with Kevin Durant. They'd be in a playoff spot right now. Yep. They'd absolutely be in a playoff spot right now with the, ta- with the talent around them. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Joe Harris. I mean... He's been hit or miss, but either way, when now you have capable shooters on your team with Kevin Durant, like forget about Kyrie Irving, like this it's team- gone so bad for Ben Simmons that um, I don't know if you saw, but the Dallas Mavericks fouled Ben Simmons under the basket, and so it was called obviously a foul on the floor, and the Dallas Mavericks were asking the refs to make it a shooting foul, so Ben Simmons would have to shoot from the free throw line. That's how bad. Imagine, it's imagine, hack-a-shack. imagine anybody doing that. At least Shaq made his free throws when it counted. Shaq still would he would be willing to shoot them. Ben doesn't want to shoot them. Like that's the craziest part about it is the guy is. You can't even blame him on psychological or mental health or anything. This is just a guy who just sucks. He he doesn't he didn't get better in any aspect of his game, which is the worst thing about it. And I mean, again, the Brooklyn Nets. I think assuming no trades happen, Kyrie plays. 
I think they'll still make the playoffs just because like they have enough talent to do it. KD and Kyrie, man. But it's just it's it's not this is not what you wanted if you're a Brooklyn Nets <laughs> fan. Your expectations were championship. 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 And this is as you pointed out, I think this is the most disappointing uh like team or era Super ever. Team. This is like, I don't, I don't think there's anything team. comparable to this. Nothing. The, the, and it's not even just because of on the court they suck, but off the court, like, it's um, just a complete breakdown of organizational cohesiveness. And honestly, a lot of people were dogging on Steve Nash for the job that he did. Now, he wasn't the best coach in the world. I'll, I'm going to be honest, but it kind of sucks. He, but. Uh, but he never had experience. But also, I feel relieved being a guy, a fan of Steve Nash. Because, he's again, he's one of the smartest players to play the game. He is. He's hands down one of the smartest guys to play to ever play. But, dude, I'm more relieved for the guy that he now doesn't have to deal with this stress anymore because the stress of being the head coach of this team is not worth any paycheck. Like, Steve Nash just needs a vacation, which I'm pretty sure he took one. Like, just go go play some soccer or something, man. Like, like dude, like, you don't need this shit. But either way, now the, the Nets... They were, and the funniest thing about the Nets situation, they almost made it worse because they were about to hire Ime Odoka, <laughs> which I oh, still man. to this to this day wonder how can a suspended coach get a new job? Well, he was suspended by the Celtics. That's I, why. I, how but does that work contractually? Like you're suspended from one job, how do you just get another one? Like it it makes no sense to so, me. So I mean, th- like it's crazy, right? That's why people are like. People were saying, uh, might as well sign Josh Primo at this point. But <laughs> the yeah, Nets man, are, the uh, Nets are the Nets. They're they're a mess. And now again, they they walked back. They're not hiring Ime Udoka. They ended up promoting Jacques Vaughn, which they probably should have done in the beginning. Uh, Listen, man, I like Jacques coach. Vaughn. I do, but he's not great as a coach either. But if there's one but, guy who was there for the for when the Nets actually had a strong culture, it was Jacques Vaughn. Like he's been there. He's respect. At least he's respected. Or at least what we think he's respected, and you have to see what he can do. He did a decent job as, as an interim when you know the Nets fired um, uh, Kenny Atkinson. So you know you might as well see what he can do ultimately. But yeah, the Nets have been bad. They've been honestly they've been worse than a disappointment to be honest with you because we all expected a cha- at least one championship or at least a finals run. They haven't even gotten that. Have they? No, they haven't been to a conference final either. Nope. Yeah, so the Nets have been absolutely disappointing. But those were our sort of biggest surprises and disappointments of this of the season so far. Uh, definitely, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, there's definitely teams that probably we you know we missed or we probably could have talked about. But again, this season has been very exciting. Uh, honestly, it's beyond the in- besides the injuries. I mean, you know, this season's looking like it's going to be. Uh, Pretty entertaining, to say the least. It looks like a good one, man. It does. But with that, that concludes this week's episode. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Definitely subscribe to the show on all the various platforms. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio, and of course on YouTube. Definitely subscribe to the show so you don't miss great content from us in the future. Also, follow us on social media, Twitter and Instagram at upletter and under podcast, facebook.com slash up and under podcast for all the latest updates whenever we post a new episode or reaction to news as they occur. Definitely follow us there for some updates on, on the show. Um... And yeah, check out our website, upandunderpodcast.com. It's our central hub for the show. It's a place where we write blog posts with every single episode. So if you don't have time to listen or watch the full episode, you can read about it on our website. Every one of our episodes that we post on our website has the video, audio, and the written version all in one place for you. So definitely check that out if you haven't done so. And yeah, man, uh, the season is going to keep on moving. But like we said, man, this is, this, this is turning out to be a pretty exciting one. But uh, with that, that concludes this episode. We'll see you guys on the next one. Take it easy. Easy.